Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our third annual Israel Antiquities Authority Lecture at Museum of the Bible, sponsored in collaboration with the Friends of the Israel Antiquities Authority. This year, of course, we are virtual, but my Zoom background is a photograph of the Israel Antiquities Authority Gallery at Museum of the Bible. We are honored to host this exhibition, which includes over 700 artifacts from Israel, selected and curated by the IAA. Among those artifacts is pottery produced by that famous biblical enemy of the Israelites, the Philistines. Through the work of tonight's speaker, Dr. Daniel Master and his colleagues at Ashkelon, we now know much more about the ancient Philistines than we did just a few years ago, who they were, how they lived, and especially as we'll hear tonight, where they came from. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Daniel Master, Professor of Archaeology at Wheaton College. For more than 25 years, Dr. Master's archaeological research has been a part of the Leon Levy expedition to Ashkelon, an ancient city of the Philistines. That excavation has concluded and he is working now to publish the results of many seasons of digging. Dr. Master is also co-director of another project in Israel at Tel Shimron. In cooperation with his co-director, Mario Martin of Tel Aviv University, he is, he is investigating the largest city in the Jezreel Valley. This excavation at Tel Shimron has been for the past five years sponsored by Museum of the Bible. And we're just starting to see publications come out from that excavation actually. So you'll hear more about that in the future. But tonight's topic is the Philistines and what Dr. Master and his colleagues have discovered. At the conclusion of the presentation tonight, there will be opportunity for questions. So if you go to the chat feature in the Zoom app, you can type your questions as we go along and uh, we'll save those for the end or you can ask your questions at the end. So thank you and I'll introduce and turn it over to Dr. Daniel Master. Thank you, Jeff, for that kind introduction and thank all of you for joining us virtually for this rather unusual lecture that is part of an annual series of lectures at the Museum of the Bible to showcase the work of the Israel Antiquities Authority. Now, I don't work for the Ant Israel Antiquities Authority, so it's a bit of an odd match. And of course, it's an odd match because bringing someone from Israel this year was just not possible. So as we discussed what to do, uh, I worked with the Friends of the Israel Antiquities Authority and the Museum of the Bible to think about how we could honor the Israel Antiquities Authority and keep their work in everyone's view because what they're doing is so important. They're the group that not only protects all the sites in Israel, but also curates the objects that are discovered over the long term. They're the custodians of an incredible cultural heritage that benefits us all. And so we wanna to continue to think about them and think about the friends of the Israel Antiquities Authority, even during these times when we can't go to Israel and they can't come here. And so in some level, I'm a stand-in, but I'm one who I hope will do a job that will honor the work of the Israel Antiquities Authority. And so as I thought about how to organize the lecture, I thought about that exhibit that is at the museum put together by the curators of the Israel Antiquities Authority in which they talk about these peoples of the land. And so I've titled my lecture, Peoples of the Bible, the Philistines, in order to try to connect all those dots. And I really I look forward to the day when I'll once again be able to go over to Israel and collaborate with my colleagues at the Israel Antiquities Authority and that they'll be able to come back to Washington for next year's lecture, I hope, um, uh, by the Israel Antiquities Authority, by, by their great scholars, so that they can show you the work that they're doing, which is tremendous. I'm talking today about the Philistines, and as Jeff mentioned, the work that I'm doing now comes from, I was looking at it, and this is my 30th year working on the material from Ashkelon. And Ashkelon is one of the five Philistine cities, along with Ashdod and Gaza and Gat and Ekron. And I'll mention all of those at different points, but my work has primarily been at Ashkelon and has been part of the Leon Levy expedition to Ashkelon. And so this expedition, a long-term project sponsored by Leon Levy and Shelby White, and now by the Leon Levy Foundation, 
has uncovered a rich city for thousands of years, helping us to understand a period from the Calcolithic period all the way through the Crusades, although today I'll take a much smaller slice of that and just deal with the Philistines. To mention the work at Ashkelon, though, I also have to mention another person, and that's Lawrence Steger. Uh, Larry Steger was my mentor, and he's the founder of the Ashkelon Expedition. And uh, he had in his mind that he wanted to study the Philistines and understand where they came from and how their lives developed and what happened to them. And he saw Ashkelon as a place that he could do that. So he devoted much of his research life to trying to understand the Philistines. And so at some level today, I'm trying to carry on his legacy in the next generation as he had that as one of his major research topics. And another thing that he had as a research topic that he taught me that I'm gonna to try to model tonight is that he saw himself as a historian, a historian of the Philistines. And as a historian, he felt it important to use all the sources at his disposal. He wanted to use archeology span and use it well, but he also wanted to use the biblical text and use it well. And so sort of as a historian tonight, talking about the Philistines, I'm gonna to try to dip into both of those sources, to dip into both archeology span and the biblical text and to give a sense for some different moments, some different times when we can see different things about this group of people and their development over 600 years. I've kind of divided tonight's lecture into four parts. So first I'm gonna talk about Philistine migration. Now that's sort of been the hot topic recently and so I'm gonna get it out of the way right at the beginning. Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about conflict and crisis, uh, another moment for the Philistines just a little bit later. I'm then gonna talk about cultural similarity. We'll see that. And then finally, I'll talk about a co common enemies and a common fate as we think about the end of the Philistines. So those are my four moments. You'll see them reflected at the bottom of the slide so you'll kind of know where you are. And I'm gonna take it chronologically. So we'll sort of start with the 12th century BC, the beginning of the Philistines, and we'll go from there. So that's our plan for the evening to try to sketch out the Philistines to understand what was happening sort of reflected through the lens of Ashkelon. I have just a general map here, and it's not because I don't think you know where Israel is or anything else like that, because I wanted to think about sort of this question of the origin of the Philistines. Uh, really, it had not been a major issue in biblical scholarship. It's kind of a footnote. It's not like the biblical authors make anything particular out of where particularly the Philistines came from. And so if you look at scholars in the 17th century, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, who are trying to wrestle with this question of where the Philistines came from, they have all kinds of ideas. Maybe they came from Turkey, maybe they came from Egypt, maybe they came all the way from someplace off the map to the east. All kinds of ideas were out there. They were ideas that really didn't have much behind them. There wasn't much data to work with. And, and again, it wasn't such a compelling question for them as they looked at these. It was kind of the kind of thing that you might find in a Bible encyclopedia a sort of idea, but not really something that was a huge issue. And, and that changed in the early 19th century with the decipherment of hieroglyphics, because when hieroglyphics were deciphered, all of a sudden you could read these ancient Egyptian records and ancient history came alive in a completely new way. And this is also true with the decipherment of cuneiform texts in Mesopotamia. But here we're talking about Egyptian texts and particularly some Egyptian texts of the Pharaoh Ramses III, a Pharaoh of the first half of the 12th century BC, found at this site at Medinat Habu. And these texts really changed the picture because in these texts, he recorded an ancient movement of people. And so here we have his re the record of the ancient movement of people as, as uh, translated by the most recent publication of these texts by Donald Radford. And you can see what immediately caught his eye as I circle it here. It's this group of people right here. Immediately it caught the eyes of the people in the 19th century. The Champollion um, already saw this, uh, the decipherer of hieroglyphics himself. These palisade and linked them to the biblical Philistines. And so here you had a text, an ancient text from the 12th century that all of a sudden brought this issue in a new, into new light and, and brought it to the sort of uh, everyone's attention in a new way. And, and not only did it talk about the Philistines, but also it talked about them coming from someplace else. And you can see a list of places that they traveled through. And I've, I've mapped them out given what we think today is the best sort of connection for each one of these names. And it sort of describes a movement of people from someplace in the West, again, it's somewhat vague, um, across the Mediterranean, into the Northeastern Mediterranean. And then finally, it appears, 
down to Egypt. I think that's the best reading of this text still. Um, and so all of a sudden this put on the map, this movement of this group of people from a place in a way that no one had ever seen before. And one of the reasons it caught everyone's attention was because of precisely where they might be coming from, this world of the Aegean. If you think about this in the 19th century, you have uh, in the late 19th century, Heinrich Schliemann going off to Troy to try to see if these stories of the ancient Greeks, these stories of the Trojan War had any background. And so uh, we have then a connection between these ancient texts of the Egyptians and some of the great classical stories. Of course, we know that the, the Trojan War and sort of this literature spun out groups of people all across the Mediterranean. So we have the Odyssey with Odysseus, or we have the Aeneid with Aeneas and moving out from Troy. And there's a legend here that I'm uh, mentioning on the right-hand side, this legend of Mopsus, which is of a fellow who uh, led bands of survivors of Troy over to Cilicia, or Mopsuestia, for instance, is a name named after him. And we have eighth century BC texts that mention the house of Mopsus. Uh, but also in Ashkelon's lore, he was thought to have brought a bunch of people down, survivors of the Trojan War, all the way to Ashkelon. So now all of a sudden we had some really interesting texts and the study of the Philistines and the study of this question, of the origin of the Philistines became sort of a hot topic and has maintained its status as sort of one of the topics that archeologists focus on with the Philistines since the middle of the 19th century. Uh, in the early 20th century, archeologists got involved in the area of the Southern Levant and they got involved by noticing that the pottery that they were finding in places like Bet Shemesh and other places that are sort of in the area there and today in Southern Israel had connections to pottery that they had seen earlier on in the Aegean, even in Crete and places like that. Here I've picked just two examples. I could pick many, many more that are of similar shape. And they looked at these pieces of pottery and said, I wonder if this is the archeological manifestation of what's happening in these texts. I wonder if we can connect texts and archeology span and get this picture of the Philistines as this immigrant group. Now, again, none of this was of great consequence for the biblical text very much, but it became kind of its own um, research goal. It became a dominant idea that archeologists who were interested in the Philistines were searching for. And as archeological work progressed in the middle of the 20th century, even in the late 20th century, now all of a sudden you could use many more resources in order to try to answer this question. So initially it was the pottery. It was this beautifully decorated pottery on the left that we often call uh, Philistine monochrome or Philistine 3C pottery. And then on the right, we have this beautiful bichrome crater, which is not so different from one that's found in the exhibit of the Israel Antiques Authority at the Museum of the Bible today, you can see these objects. And the connection between these objects, the stylistic similarity between these objects and ones back in the homeland was one of the things that initially interested archeologists, but they continued on to look at this in different and more sophisticated ways. It wasn't just similar pottery. They started to look at ways of preparing food or food that was being eaten. And they found that some of the culinary habits or culinary patterns that you had in earlier times, let's say in the 13th century in the Aegean world, all of a sudden spring up out of nothing, it seems, uh, in this area of the Southern Levant, in this area of sort of this coastal Canaan region of the Bronze Age. Now in the 12th century, we see these new customs. I have your beautiful square hearth on the right-hand side and a cooking jug on the left-hand side with some bones of a dog. And even these dog dogs in jars are something that you find in Crete, for instance. And so people said there are family patterns, there are culinary patterns that are showing this connection back to the West. Um, industrial technology uh, was found to be different and found to have patterns that looked far more like other places in the Mediterranean. So I show here weaving technology. You can see the uh, reconstruction of a loom in the lower right-hand corner. And then you have these small spool weights, which were found in rows along a wall at Ashkelon. And we did the sort of small analysis of all the particles that were next to them. We found unusual concentrations of lint in this particular place as if they were using the loom in this very location. It helped us to understand what these weights were and the way they were used on one of these vertical looms. And again, this was a pattern that when we looked for it, we found in other places as well, all the way back in the Aegean in earlier periods as well. 
So what you had was more and more ways of life, more and more cultural patterns that seemed to show what the text seemed to have said, at least initially. And uh, we can, well, I'll show you a couple other examples of this same phenomenon when we look at architecture. Uh, we see the architecture in the areas of Ashkelon and Akron and Ashto, those Philistine cities, changed. It changed substantially and it changed in ways that were different than the people around them, but in all of these cases, ways that seem to mirror patterns, patterns of privacy, patterns of house construction, patterns of the way in which space was moved around that had uh, their origins, it seemed, in places farther to the west. And of course, houses aren't something that move. You have to come with the idea of the house, the concept of the house. And so that was something that couldn't even be traded or moved around. You needed to kind of have a, an idea coming to Ashkelon and places like that at this time in the 12th century. And all of this is taking place in the 12th century. I finally show you one last uh, example of these cultural similarities that caused archeologists to argue that the text and the archeology span together showed in a migration of the Philistines from the area of the Aegean in the 12th century. And this last one I, it is a little fun. Um, it's something that Larry Steger had worked on himself. And uh, what we're looking at here on the, in these two images are Aegean pictures of sailors or of warriors. And you'll notice that they draw the faces quite strangely. They sort of have this hairstyle that's flying out here. And then they also draw them in profile with this one eye and the long nose. So we kind of get this picture here, or maybe this picture here of these individuals um, in the way in which they, the artistic convention that you had in the Aegean world. And when uh, we excavated Ashkelon, we found pottery that was decorated in similar ways. So we'll have this fellow here, or this fellow here. Again, strange depictions of a person, but following a convention, following a cultural pattern, following a way of thinking about the world. And so you had these different things, whether again, it was the pottery or the architecture or the food or the industrial technology, all of these cultural patterns in a wide and deep way across sites like Ashkelon and Akron and Ashdod changed in the 12th century. I went back this morning and I watched a video. I watched a video of one of these old lectures, these Israel Antiquity Authority lectures before they came to the Museum of the Bible when they were still being offered in New York. And I went and watched the lecture of uh, Professor Lawrence Steger, my mentor, as he uh, talked about this particular issue. And he spent 45 minutes or more on this particular issue, because so much of his life's work was about saying, let's see the text and the artifact in conversation and how they result in a historical synthesis. And for him, the historical synthesis was, we can show the migration of a people group from the West to the East. We can show a group coming from the Aegean, someplace there, and in the 12th century arriving in Ashkelon, at a time he would have dated into the first half of the 12th century BC. And I'll talk about that today just a little bit more in a second. But um, one of the problems that he faced, and he knew he knew it was a, it was a problem, um, was that texts, even texts written by the Egyptians at the time, can sometimes either be misleading or very hard to interpret. What are these islands? Where exactly did the Philistines end up? Are this is this really the Philistines or he also knew that artifacts could be traded. Pottery can move, pottery styles can move, even architectural styles can move across space. Just because you have a change in culture doesn't necessarily mean you have a change in people. Now, I think, and he thought, that he'd assembled enough evidence of this wide and deep evidence that he could make the case just based on this indirect evidence alone. And, and, and I, I still think he was right. I still think he could do that. But in the years since he gave that lecture, I think it was 2012, the lecture that I was watching, in the years that he's, he, since that, there have been several articles. I just show you two examples uh, of people who've said, that's not enough. That this whole Philistine phenomenon has been, uh, is overwrought. That really we can't say this kind of thing from that kind of evidence that these texts aren't so clear, even the Egyptian texts, and that this material culture can't clearly be shown to be directly brought by these people, or there are other pathways that we need to explore, or maybe just 
most of it came by trade or something, all kinds of different hypotheses that one might have that sort of detract from Professor Steger's hypothesis shared by many that this was an example of migration. And so starting in 2013, we decided to try to test this in a different way. We wanted to find a way to directly test whether the Philistines were migrants, whether they had come from outside. Again, the pottery and architecture and artifacts weren't gonna be enough. And the text, even the Egyptian texts were uh, not agreed upon by scholars enough that we thought we needed to find a different way. Now, fortunately, this is a picture of Ashkelon and we've been excavating Ashkelon for some time. And in our excavations at Ashkelon, we had excavated throughout its history. And so we had a wide array of data upon which to draw in order to be able to answer this question. It was important that we weren't just looking at the 12th century Philistine migration, but that we sort of looked a little bit broad, in a broader way. And so what we needed to do in order to understand if a new group of people came to Ashkelon was to look at the people themselves, to look at the DNA that one could grab from the material remains that they had left behind and to analyze what was the nature of the local population and then did a new group of people join this local population. So we had to start by establishing a baseline, which we did. So we started excavating in this area of the site and these excavations had already taken place in the 1990s. And in those excavations, we'd uncovered a series of family tombs. These family tombs were from the Bronze Age, that is before the 12th century. And they were gonna help us to understand what the baseline pattern was for people living in Ashkelon before any proposed Philistine migration. And so these um, spots in red that you see represent samples that we were successfully able to extract DNA from individuals, and then also able to date using radiocarbon dating to show us that these really were not 12th century or not later or not modern or any of those types of things, but really Bronze Age individuals. So we did this testing and I'll show you these results. Um, but in order to show you those results, I kind of have to explain how those results work. When uh, geneticists want to understand a population, they need to find earlier populations that are different so that it, they can express any person as a combination of earlier groups because every one of us is a combination of earlier populations. So they look for really distinct early groups. And in this case, we go back to the Stone Age when they're looking at really distinct early groups and they find out that there are some really distinct early groups. One, we have these Western European hunter-gatherers you see as A on this particular chart. They're really distinct, they're just different. They've lived by themselves for a long time. We have C, the Levantine farmers. We'll see them come up a couple times. And then we have the Iranian farmers and they look different enough that you can express all the populations in Europe and in the Near East today as a percentage or as a combination of those three groups that I've just mentioned, of the Western European hunter-gatherers, Levantine farmers, Iranian farmers. Everybody's a mix in, the, in those areas, is a mix of those three earlier groups of people. So we wanted to look at Ashkelon and what did it look like? And so when we looked at our individuals from the Bronze Age, from earlier times, we found that they were a mix just of two of these groups. They were a mix of the Levantine farmers and the Iranian farmers. And we now know from other excavations at places like Megiddo or Sidon that this is typical for the Bronze Age population of the region. And so it's not unusual. It's not a, it isn't a surprise to us. And it allows our individuals to fall. And you can see this piece called the Near Eastern Klein, which is where most Near Eastern populations are even today, this mix of these two groups. So we had our baseline. And then what we did is we wanted to add to the baseline to say, okay, now what was it like when the 12th century happened and we think the Philistines arrived? We had to move to another part of the site where we'd been excavating. So we moved a little farther to the middle of the site. And as we move farther to the middle of the site, we're dealing with a different kind of thing. Here we're dealing with uh, a sequence of cities, one on top of the other, and that's what those sort of gray uh, plans are. And the sequence of cities the earliest one comes from the time of Ramses III. You can see that asterisk and the scarab of Ramses III in that particular city. So we know all the other cities on top are later than this, right? How much later is an open question. We have some DNA 
uh, I mean, sorry, some radiocarbon results that tell us that this is all in the 12th century, more or less, but nevertheless, later than Ramses III in our particular case. And so we then have is a series of, um, series of samples taken from infants that were buried under the floors of these houses and that post-date Ramses III. So we have before this time when the migration is supposed to have occurred and after. And we looked at after, we found out, again, here back to our original pattern, um, we have we want to see what the combination is going to be. But before I show you that combination, I need to add one more complex piece, which is to say that if you look at the European Klein today, you'll see it doesn't look an awful lot like these Western European hunter-gatherers. They're way out there. Something has caused this sort of genetic pattern to shift over closer to those C and D patterns. And so if we look at the history of the region sort of since the Stone Age, what you find out is that these Levantine farmers moved up into Europe, and I'll show it in this particular case, moved up into Europe sometime here uh, um, in the late Stone Age, or sort of in the times of the origins of agriculture. And sort of there's sort of part of that within the modern European patterns as well. And then also uh, a little bit later on, what you have related to the beaker culture, among other things, is these Iranian farmers moving up over through Ukraine and down into Europe as well. So this European group, European group is already a mix of these three things, but it's different than the Near Eastern group, which is just a mix of the two. And so as we looked then at the samples that we took from Ashkelon from the 12th century, what we found was that these infants who'd been buried, these Philistines, were a mix of all three. And that this mix of all three was the hallmark of groups that were much farther to the West and didn't look like our baseline population. Now, obviously these infants didn't move, their parents or grandparents did. And so as we sort of modeled this, we could sort of say, somebody's moving here, they're living in houses, they've set up a family, they're having children. This is a new group of people. And when we looked at every one of these infants, none of them were related to each other. And each one of them showed the hallmarks of being descendants of immigrants from the West here in the 12th century. So we had our baseline and we had our result. When we looked at it more specifically, here I put up the Egyptian Medinet Habu map again. We have a blue circle on this map, which marks the easternmost range that we can argue right now as being the range where they came from. This circle extends all the way to Spain. So there's a broader range than I've shown on this map. And it's the kind of thing that with future research is going to be a smaller circle or perhaps modified in different ways, but this is where we are right now. We can demonstrate that the Philistines migrated from the West, not indirectly through their pottery or through some other bit of material culture or even through a text, but directly by showing that they are a different population. And this sort of is, is part of this 200 year search for the origins of the Philistines. And we think it really represents a breakthrough and a new horizon. And in some ways it helps us to build on the work of people like Larry Steger and say, yes, the latest evidence reaffirms this idea that we saw from the archeology, span that we saw from the text, that this is a group of people who comes from outside. Now, we'll learn more about this group in the coming years as more samples emerge, and as we get more sort of coverage of the Bronze Age throughout the Mediterranean. Uh, but we were really excited because this was something that we had been working on for a long time and was really part of the legacy of Ashkelon and its search for the origins of the Philistines. Now, um, at one level, that's, that's, that's a highlight. That's a, as archeologists have searched for the Philistines, this is what they've been searching for, this question of the origins of the Philistines. But as I mentioned at the beginning, from the biblical standpoint, biblical text standpoint, it's not, it's not the story. It's not uh, the key set of relationships that are being expressed in that text. There's more to the history of the Philistines than just where they came from. And so I wanna talk about some of those things as well. So we can come back to this and you can ask questions about it and I'm happy to follow up on it, but I wanna move on and talk about some of the other moments in Philistine history that we've been able to sort of elucidate at Ashkelon and get a better sense for uh, through our research and through our study of biblical text. So I'm moving forward. And as I move forward, I'm going to, um, this is my little bit of, I don't know, uh, promotion, I guess, uh, in November of 2020, uh, we produced our seventh final report volume, Ashkelon 7, um, on the Iron Age 1. Uh, 
this Iron Age one period from around 1200 to 1000 uh, really covers this time of the earliest Philistines in their migration. But more than that, it really takes us all the way, as I said, through around 1000. And so if we imagine that sequence of cities that I mentioned to you before, so maybe start around 1200 down here and then go all the way up to 1000 up here, as apologies for my handwriting. And so we get more than just where they came from. We get a whole sort of cross section of their history through time. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of those things as well, because as we did this research, we started to see other interesting things about their history and their development through time. Specifically, as uh, my co-editor Adam Aja and I read through this volume, it's about a thousand pages. We have more than 40 scholars from around the world providing their expertise on this material we kept coming across a common refrain. We kept coming across people who were saying somewhere in the middle of this period, between 1200 and 1000, things change pretty substantially. And they would talk about the nature of those changes. So you would, you would read the study of the botany and in the study of the botany, someone would say at this point, and I've highlighted it here right in the middle, so again, based upon our radiocarbon dates, this would still be, let's say, in the latter half of the 12th, the beginning of the 11th century, so in the middle of that period. Um, they would say, in this case, bitter vetch appears. That's a famine plant. That's the kind of thing that people eat when there isn't anything else to eat. We would find out that uh, cattle were no longer being eaten in the same way. They were being replaced by much easier to raise pigs. And we were finding that this cattle consumption, we looked at the ages of the animals, they were eating everything that moved that wasn't the best cuts of meat. It seemed like they were under stress. When we looked at their international connections, we found out that no longer were they connected to Cyprus and Egyptian material declines precipitously. When we looked at the pottery and where it was from, we found that imports declined by 50%. All of these are major economic shocks. And as we looked across the chapters, each, each person would say something about this period and would say, this is where we start to see much, many fewer bronze tools. We have an increase in the rodents in the area, which is sort of strange, don't know what to make of it. We find that even in when they're looking at weaving, the fine fabrics are no longer being made and it's only the rough stuff because you could see it based on the sizes of the loom weights. And as we put this together, we realized that somewhere in the middle here, we have a major stress at Ashkelon. We have a major decline and, and, a, and, a, and a crisis, an economic crisis in this particular period. Now, when you look at the cover of this volume, you get a sense for the way Ashkelon is oriented because it's this semicircle next to the sea. And so anytime you have a major decline like this, usually it's related to the question of the maritime economy. And so when we think about what's going on here from the 13th to the 12th to the 11th century, what we have is a massive decline in Mediterranean trade. Greek is gonna enter the so-called dark ages right in this period because of the lack of those interconnections, the lack of maritime trade in Ashkelon, perhaps more than any other Philistine really signals that, really shows us that those sea connections, they came from someplace else, they came by boat, we think, uh, those sea connections were being lost and those trading connections were being lost and Ashkelon was really suffering. We think that that was true of Ashkelon probably most significantly, but it's part of a general trend that we see in Philistia itself. Just at this time, again, the end of the 12th century and the beginning of the 11th century, we start to see more Philistine material spreading to the east and spreading to the north. The very earliest material that appears at Megiddo, which was occupied through the 13th and the 12th and the 11th century, appears just at the end of the 12th century and the beginning of the 11th century, according to their radiocarbon dates. And what we have then is pottery at Megiddo made in Ashkelon, so we know that it's the same, and we can connect it to our cultural sequence and see that it's right in the middle here as well. We have a decline, we think, in Mediterranean trade, and then um, a move to the east. And this move to the east, we think these things are related and that the negative consequences of this economic collapse of the Mediterranean forced the Philistines to start looking elsewhere and thinking about the world in a different way. I'm showing here a map of the highlands. You can see Jerusalem here. And we have then these roads around Jerusalem, a lot of sites from this period. The roads that are highlighted are sort of the core roads around Jerusalem in the late Bronze Age kingdom of Jerusalem, at least, and probably um, in many periods as well. 
Now, what we find in this period is that there are uh, a lot of small little villages around and some other fortified sites. And a number of biblical scholars have argued that this is a time when we see Philistine pottery here in this particular area as well in the highlands, that perhaps the Philistines were expanding imperially, were kind of moving up into the highlands and kind of making that part of a growing empire. I don't think that's quite the right way to look at it, but certainly something in this particular period of the 11th century now shows a new connection, a new way of seeing the relationship between these Philistines who previously had been just on the coast and the Highlanders who were living in the area around Jerusalem. Now here I think we want to look at some biblical texts. And the reason we want to look at some biblical text, I'll use biblical text at different points here uh, today, and as I look at biblical text, many times when they were written won't be of particular consequence to me, or the periods in which they're written won't be of particular consequence to me, but in this case it is more so. And so I've highlighted at the bottom some places you can go for sort of a discussion of some of the redactional elements related to the text that I'm citing, very specifically these texts, um, as we sort of try to understand how in something like the Bible and the books of Samuel and Kings, we have many sources that are being used, some of them cited by the authors themselves. And we're trying to get a sense for when those sources were written and what's the nature of the world that they describe. And there's two sort of sources that I'm working with that have been outlined by some of the authors that you can see on the left-hand side, particularly Jeremy Hutton and some of his students from the University of Wisconsin. Um, one is called the narrative of Saul's rise and the other is called the history of David's rise. And these two sort of redactional strands within the broader history of Samuel and Kings, um, some of Hutton's students have argued, um, reflect some of these earlier times, uh, are, raised, are, are dealing with questions related to these earlier times, perhaps even as early as the late 11th and 10th century. Well, you can look at their work for more discussion, but I'm building off of their work to say, what kind of a world do we see in this particular period? And I wanted to specifically look at two sort of terms that the authors use. The one is this uh, Natsiv and the other Matsav, uh, same root. Um, and basically people often talk about the garrisons of the Philistines or these rulers of the Philistines who were up in this area during, in these passages in Samuel, the time when Saul or David were running around in this particular part of the world. And I, I wanted to look at them. And as I started to look at them, what I realized was that um, whenever you would see these passages, these mentions of these Philistines, these Philistine garrisons, uh, they were in some strange places. Uh, let's, for instance, in um, 1 Samuel 10, 5, it's, it's when Saul was just declared king by Samuel and he's getting these sort of oracular signs from Rachel's tomb, from a sacred oak, and then from the hill of the gods at which there's a garrison of the Philistines. But it's just sort of an oracular center. It's not necessarily a major urban setting, it's just some spot on the road. Or in 1 Samuel 13 and 1 Samuel 14, we have a Philistine raiding party between Michmash and Geba that's being described as a, as a garrison. Maybe you remember some of those uh, stories. Uh, the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer uh, fits into this particular section, although it has been reconstructed with different characters by some of the uh, um, scholars who I have cited here. Um, nevertheless, uh, it's, it's a story of someone attacking a garrison of the Philistines. And then remember this in the story, Jonathan's in hiding and he comes out with his armor bearer and he's called up to the garrison and he attacks and a rout ensues. There's no walls, there's no gates, there's no buildings, there's no infrastructure. All we have is a raiding party, a raiding party that sends out sort of groups of people, north, south, east, and west to just get stuff. Right? And when they lose, when they lose in any of their battles, they don't run back to a fortified center in the highlands. They run all the way down to places like Ekron and Gath, their fortified cities in the lowlands. This is an, an imperial move. These people are desperate raiders who are not able to conquer any fortified city, but are sort of ravaging the landscape in their, I would argue, desperate search for some way to sustain themselves in the midst of an otherwise collapsed world. And so what we have is you know, the passage in 2 Samuel 23 mentions a group of Philistines coming up the Rephaim Valley and then trying to send out a group to Bethlehem to get stuff. Even the passages, which I haven't listed here, where David is fighting on behalf of Kayla down here 
the Philistines aren't attacking the fortified center there, not all. They're attacking the threshing floors. They're stealing grain. And so when we look at these patterns a little bit and we look at some of these texts, we find out that the Philistines are sort of desperate raiders who are not able to conquer any of the fortified cities, don't ever seem to inhabit any of the fortified cities, and are simply marauding through the landscape looking for things that they can steal and take off. In the Kale episode, they're taking all the livestock home, right, and take it back to Philistia. Um, Avi Faust has looked at this and has argued that the Philistines devastate the rural sector. This is a picture, a graph he made in 2016 is when he published it in English. Um, well, actually published it several times. Um, 2003 perhaps is the earliest in his publication. But in any case, he um, mapped out sites that are Iron Age one sites, 1200 to 1000, and rural sites that are later. And he noted that all of the rural sites that he mapped out that were earlier all stopped right in this period. And he attributed that in many respects to the Philistines. And he said, this is what happened. You have a group of people, and now I would argue that we can see why that desperation that they had come up into the area and cause all kinds of trouble. This one site that doesn't seem to fall in this particular period is the one site here, the rural site that's fortified. It's Kirbet Edduwara, you can see on the map there. But if you weren't a fortified site, then you were susceptible to these Philistine raids. There's an obvious solution to that, which is fortify things, right? So if we look at Tel El Ful here as reconstructed by Paul and Nancy Lapp, we have an idea of a site for more or less this period that is being fortified. And again, that's all you needed to do. Or think of the work that's been done by Yossi Garfinkel and his colleagues at Kerbet Kayafa, a little bit farther to the west. Again, it's a site that is fortified. It's a small little site, but it's already fortified. And again, if all that's all you had to do to prevent these kinds of raids from taking place. Um, certainly Jerusalem was fortified during this period and no one thought of attacking it. And certainly the inhabitants thought that it couldn't be attacked. And uh, in the Philistine side, Ekron and Gath, particularly Gath was not able to be conquered by anyone else uh, from the highlands either. These fortified sites sort of were the anchors. And so it makes a lot of sense that what happens in this period in the highlands as a response to some of the things that are happening in the Philistines is a move away from the rural sector and a move into fortified sites. And that seems in some ways to have solved the problem. And so this crisis and conflict, as we've been looking at the Philistine material, we've been starting to ask the question, why would they even go up into the, go to the east? And in what manner are they going up into the east? And, and looking at sort of some of those finds from Ashkelon, we're sort of getting a sense for the way in which the decline in the Mediterranean trade forced them to search for other avenues of food, and that brought them into conflict with the Highlanders and some of the ways in which those two things work themselves out over time. And indeed, the way they work themselves out is when we move now into the 10th and the 9th century, what you end up with is a number of fortified cities. So certainly you're going to have fortified for sort of the Highland side of things. We're going to see Gezer and Timna and Beit Shemesh are going to be fortified. And then from the Philistine side, Gath is going to be your major site. Gath or God is going to be your major site uh, during the 10th and the 9th century, a major fortified city of which uh, the excavations by Aaron Meir have uncovered some of those gates and fortifications, uh, very large. And then also you're going to have places like Tel Hesse or Lachish, which are fortified again from the Highland side and are creating sort of a bit of a border, a bit of a, uh, um, a way of sort of keeping the raids from happening, happening on either side and basically creating a more or less, a more stable situation for the next several hundred years. And so we have then this, the rural sector gone, but these fortified sites on either side of sort of a border more or less, but these sort of fortified sites keeping people from attacking and moving uh, on either side uh, between the Philistines and the Israelites as we move into the late 10th and into the 9th century as we're moving forward. This, again, stasis in terms of this, this or this new equilibrium that's that, that is the result of some of these changes, this new equilibrium um, creates now the world of the 10th and the 9th century for both groups of people. 
And at Ashkelon, we were able to look at this 10th and 9th century in an interesting way through our discovery of a cemetery at Ashkelon. It was the first large cemetery that was associated with any of these Philistine sites with Ashkelon or Ashdod or Ekron or Goth or Gaza. And so it really was an important one for helping us to understand the Philistines, but also the Philistines in this particular period. Here I show a some pictures of those excavations working with uh, Dr. Adam Aja and Dr. Sherry Fox, our physical anthropologist. Um, and here we are working on trying to understand these Philistines. Now, a little bit later in time, during this time in which there's this new equilibrium between the Highlanders and the Lowlanders, and we sort of are getting a sense for what that means for them as their cultures are developing. Just a few words about these, uh, about this particular cemetery. I'll mention that these individuals, because it's a question I always get asked, so I'm just going to answer it now, um, weren't particularly tall. People always looking sort of for Goliath-like figures. And if you look at this number here, the mean stature of males, uh, I think that's 5'1". So uh, I haven't found anyone who's taller than, than I am yet. Uh, but still, also, we find that they're under some considerable stress. Uh, what we find here in their teeth is that they suffered as children to the extent that their teeth would stop growing. And when that happened, it left a mark in the teeth such that we can see those stresses and kind of get a sense for when they occurred. And also, they weren't getting the nutrition necessary so, to, so that you would have uh, the difference between the men and the women in height that you would, let's say, with a modern diet for sure. And so what we have then is this picture of a, of a relatively stressed ancient population um, of Philistines here in the 10th and the 9th century at Ashkelon. Now, sea trade was picking up again, right? The Mediterranean in the 10th and the 9th century is absolutely picking up again, centered around the world of the Phoenicians. And so at Ashkelon, as we excavated through the cemetery, we saw them bringing in all of these beautiful little bottles of ointment or some sort of a scented oil, most likely, that were part of their funerary ceremonies. But it also gave us a sense for the way in which trade was picking up and we're sort of seeing that world of the Mediterranean uh, contributing to Ashkelon once again. But the main picture that we have in this particular period, the main picture is one of cultural similarity. This pottery that I'm showing you here from Ashkelon is very similar to the pottery that you have in the same period from the site of Goth. Both of these sites, when you look at the parallels, you'll find that you're just as likely to have a parallel from Ekron as you are from Lachish, or from Beit Shemesh, or from Timna, or from Gezer, or from Ashdod. All of those sites have all been excavated. And their pottery is very similar. We, we really can't say that there's all that much difference. Nothing on this particular plate that I have on the left-hand side would be out of place if it was found at Bet Shemesh, which seems to be, if we're thinking about that border idea, much more closely connected to the highlands than it is to the lowlands. That idea of cultural similarity is, is rather dramatic. This is the gate at Tel Gezer. Maybe some of you have walked through it. It's a lovely picture, it's often called the Solomonic Gate at Gezer. And so here it is. And it's connected to the highlands, as it should be, I think. Um, and so this gate at Gezer is a specific pattern with six chambers or four entryways. But less well known, archaeologists know it, but less well known because it can't be visited in quite the same way, is an almost identical gate at Gezer, I mean, at Ashdod. Sorry, we have the Gezer Gate and we have this one at Ashdod with the same pattern of chambers and entryways as you have at Gezer. Now, the one at Ashdod is made of mud brick and you're not visiting it as much, but what you're dealing with is a similar pattern in this urban architecture between these two sites. So the pottery is the same, the urban architecture is the same, the language is changing. This is changing. This is um, uh, an inscription from Telesophy on the right hand side that was originally by the excavators linked and connected to this whole story of Goliath. And I, I'm not sure that he would necessarily continue to have that, uh, th that quote attributed to him. I, again, it was, it was a reporter who said it. So it may, let's, let's get rid of that and sort of say, this inscription from Telesophy is important for us in terms of cultural similarity, because unlike this material from Ashkelon, this earlier material, of different scripts and different languages that doesn't look like the local world. When, by the time we get to Telesophy, they're using the local alphabet. And in every inscription from here on out, we would say they're writing in a Semitic script. They're writing in a Semitic language. They've become a Semitic people in terms of their ling socio sort of linguistic characteristics. 
cultural similarity. This is a, a amazing thing in the 10th and 9th century. And, and it's such, a, such an overwhelming thing that uh, some archeologists argue that maybe the Philistines just kind of went away that they no longer were there, that they just kind of meld, sort of merged into the rest of the populace. Moshe Dotan argued that they may have assimilated. And even Aaron Meir argues that there must be some sort of just sort of gradation between Philistine and Israelite. It's not a sharp line because he's right from a material culture standpoint, it's not sharp at all. And when we look at the genetics, look what you see. This is all of the pictures. We had our Bronze Age people who were local. We had our immigrant group. And now we have this third group and you'll notice that there's very, very little of that signal um, European, Western European hunter-gatherer uh, DNA. It's still, when you look at the details, most likely that these people in the 10th and 9th century are the descendants of this group and this group. But the fact that they're the descendants of both and to such an extent that you can no longer see this immigrant signal is something to behold. We're dealing with massive cultural similarity at this point in the middle of this setup. It reminds me of two biblical passages, um, again, whose date I'm not quibbling with. These are both very complex passages. Uh, but the one is a passage in Genesis, which is, again, um, the story of Abimelech, this time in Isaac's world, not in Abraham's. And whoever the editor was who put this together in this way and thought that Philistine was an appropriate term to apply to this king Abimelech, clearly didn't have a problem with the Philistine saying, I would like to marry someone who is related to Isaac. And that's the passage here in Genesis 26. And of course, more famously, we all remember the story of Samson. Again, when that passage is written is less important to me than what it's saying about the relationships between the two groups. In this story of the relationship between the two groups, what they're saying is Samson may be criticized for marrying a Philistine, but it happens. Right, it, it, the, the idea isn't so beyond the pale that it's, it can't take place. We seem to find that in this patrilocal society, there may be brides who are moving back and forth between these groups of people. And yet, it's not as if they're not different still. They're still the Philistines and they're still the Israelites and they're not the same. And later biblical texts and later Mesopotamian texts isolate and say, no, 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 just because you have cultural similarity doesn't mean we like each other, doesn't mean things are the same. You, you can perhaps think of examples you know of groups around the world who have been antagonistic toward one another for a very long period of time. And if you look at it from a distance, you might say, oh, they seem awfully similar. Maybe their language is similar, their culture is similar, but they're not the same. So it was here with the Philistines and Israelites. Our texts are pretty clear that they're not the same and that they are distinct groups of people all the way through. They're not mixed hybrid ideas. They are Philistines and Israelites, even though culturally, genetically, all those different ways, they look a lot, of, a lot alike, particularly to an outsider. What was, what was their distinctive idea? What distinguished the Philistines? When we look at the biblical text, later biblical texts, they, they pick out something kind of interesting. They pick out the idea that the, Philist that the Philistines had an idea of a common origin. We're the people who come from, and they picked Kaftor. That's how we're known. We're known as the remnant of Kaftor. Now, genetically, is that the case anymore? I'm, not, not discernibly, particularly. And, Material culture wise, is that the case? No, but that's the idea. That's who we are. You can think of so many groups today who are like this, who, 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 who may celebrate Independence Day in the United States, July 4th, where they didn't arrive in the United States until much, much later on. And yet they've adopted that idea of where I come from or who I am. And so we have that kind of idea of this who I am and it's connected to a place that they all came from. One last idea, common enemies and a common fate. As the Iron Age progressed, we talked about this idea of more or less a stable, a stable border. And the stable border between the sites um, is keeping these groups perhaps in some sort of stable relationship with one another as small little polities here in this corner of the Levant, but there's a lot of other much bigger entities that are sort of on the march. And what we find out is that these much bigger entities that are on the march are gonna to start to affect both of these groups simultaneously. Already in the ninth century, 
we find out that the people from Damascus are affecting both of these groups simultaneously. We find out that the King Hazael has attacked the site of Gath right here. And we find that the King, uh, you can see my, if you can see my cursor here on the map, has, uh, has attacked also then Judah at the same time. Uh, the same external force is attacking both of these groups. The same thing happens in the eighth century. Bigger forces start to act on both of these groups and their interrelationship becomes a bit of a sidebar to the much larger forces that are arrayed against them. The Assyrians are on the march. The Assyrians are going to go and going to destroy Ashto, just like Gath is destroyed in the ninth century. And we can see that archeologically in every place that they've excavated at Gath, at Tel Asafi, so too at Ashdod, 3,000 bodies are found uh, showing the devastation of the Assyrians. But these same Assyrians, as we know, are attacking the kingdom of Israel, are attacking the kingdom of Judah at the same time. All of these groups are being acted upon by the same forces. And even in this particular case, what you have is this um, action by the, let me just back up one, this action by the Assyrians in 701, in which we have probably an alliance even between the king of Ashkelon and the king of Jerusalem. Both of them are condemned specifically by the Assyrians. Not that this alliance does any good, but both of them are fighting common enemies. They're smaller groups fighting a much larger group that is the Assyrians. That like relationship between Ashkelon and Jerusalem. I'm not saying it was at all friendly, but it was sort of a, a, a response to a much larger exterior threat. And so this response to much larger exterior threat is kind of what you see even in the seventh century. In the seventh century of the Assyrians for a while, and then the Egyptians as well just make a brief comeback. And during that time, the Assyrians, the, the Egyptians make a brief comeback. I wanna just show this one last thing, which is this relationship between Ashkelon and the highlands in the world of the biblical writers um, in the form of an economic relationship. Because at Ashkelon, we uncovered really the first example of a marketplace inside a city. And this could stand for marketplaces inside many ancient cities. But our marketplace inside an ancient city, we could see had a, had a main market street, which I'm showing you here. And on this main market street, we were able to identify all kinds of activities that were taking place. If we zoom in a little bit, we have a wine shop and we have a little receipt found outside the wine shop. Someone's buying Yayanodome, red wine, right? And, and being able to buy it in sort of a retail capacity. Down the street a little farther, they're buying and selling meat that's been driven in from the east. And we see the relationship between Ashkelon and places farther afield. We see the transactions that are taking place in this marketplace in silver. And I show you in the upper right-hand corner, right up in here, I show you a, a, a weight found at Ashkelon during this period, which is of the Judean sort of shekel standard and shows us the world of Judah and the way in which those weights and measures are uh, part of the world of Ashkelon's commerce. You can find the Greek pottery that's being sold in Ashkelon's markets all the way in Jerusalem. You can see this trade going both direction, fish from the coast found up in Jerusalem. Greek pottery found up in Jerusalem. And then in this particular case, we have grain. And this grain that was found at Ashkelon in this marketplace, when the weeds were analyzed inside the grain, they were found to be from that area of Judah. And the receipt talks about the sale of grain from the fields of Zakar something, Zakar Baal, Zechariah, we're not sure but it shows the way in which this whole area was connected and in some ways even about myths the antagonism working together as part of this economic world of the seventh century. But common enemies, common fate, what we're gonna find out is that this marketplace, which could just as easily have been a marketplace image that you would have in Jerusalem or in Judah or any other Philistine city, this market world of the late seventh century was gonna be destroyed both in Philistia and in places farther to the east and recorded by the biblical writers as well as by the Babylonians because the same person was responsible. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to destroy this entire area. Common enemies, the Assyrians, Hazael of Damascus, also the Babylonians and a common fate. All of these small kingdoms, including the Philistines were destroyed in the late seventh and sixth century. And in the Philistines case, they were destroyed completely 
never to emerge again as a Philistine people taken into captivity, never to return. And their story ends here in the late seventh century with the destruction of Nebuchadnezzar taking out the last of the Philistine cities. So four different images of the Philistines, their migration, their crisis and conflict in the highlands, their sort of cultural similarity with the Highlanders in the early Iron 2A, and then finally this way in which they're all acted upon by some of these external forces in the later Iron 2 period to sort of give you a sense of these peoples of ancient Israel, these peoples of the Bible, the Philistines. Uh, I'm, I'll thank you for that at the moment. Thank you for, the, for your attention to my presentation. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff here, who's going, he's been sort of, I guess, watching some of your questions, and he's going to sort of lead us through some of the question and answer period. Jeff. Great. Thank you, Dr. Master. Uh, wonderful to walk through that, uh, the history and the text and see how, how these things relate to each other. So, I invite you to ask your questions in the chat and they'll pop up here and then I'll, I'll forward them on to, uh, to Dr. Master. Now we've got a few uh, queued up here. Uh, let's start uh, maybe with the beginning uh, of the Philistines and their origins. Um, and it's about the geography. So what geographical features made Ashkelon a desirable place for them to settle? Was it a protected port? Uh, was there a river or good water or good soil? So Ashkelon seems to have had two characteristics that were most helpful for making it a good port for maritime trade. The first was that it did have access to good water everywhere across the entire site. There's an aquifer underneath the site and any place that someone wanted to dig a well, they could come up with fresh water. More than a hundred wells we've been able to um, describe at Ashkelon. Uh, and, and it was a place that could then be well watered and could provide fresh water for someone coming ashore. The second thing that seems to be one of its major features is that it was built on some original uh, ridges that ran perpendicular to the sea and were higher than the ridges around them. And so what it gave everyone was a really good view. And so from the earliest city, what we think was one of the key characteristics was the ability to see and to be seen by ships who were passing by. And so once those ridges were connected into the semicircular shape that I showed you that Ashkelon made, then it also became a protected place as well. But it was really the height of those ridges and the fresh water that were the first things that people noticed. Ashkelon doesn't have a normal port, even though it was a major port. And so if someone wanted to bring things to Ashkelon or take things from Ashkelon, you would beach your ships, you'd pull them up on the shore, just in the soft sands, offload them, unload them, and push them off to shore again, offshore again. Great, thank you. Um, let's stick with another question related to the site at Ashkelon. Is Ashkelon the oldest and largest Philistine city? It depends when, right? There are times I think that the site of Gath is probably larger than Ashkelon and sometimes when that's not the case. Um, and when we say oldest, um, we think all the Philistines came to the region sometime in the early 12th century. And so in that sense, we're not dealing with too much of a difference in time. But when we think about oldest, then you're thinking about times before the Philistines, how much earlier do they go? And Ashkelon and many of these sites go all the way back to the Chalcolithic period. And so I would say that Ashkelon is as old as any of them. It's a city that's as, as, as large or larger than any of them. And past that, it becomes a little tricky to be precise. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so let's stick to, uh, to again, Ashkelon and uh, the language, which uh, you brought up a little bit here. So. Uh, what language or script were their tablets in? Right, so I, I went through that quite quickly and it's a subject that could to take much more of our time, but I showed you in one slide the inscription from Safi when I talked about them moving toward using uh, the local alphabet and then speaking or at least writing their things in a Semitic language. Um, earlier than that, when we look at the 12th and the 11th century, I showed some inscriptions from Ashkelon, which I didn't discuss. And I didn't discuss, one of the reasons I didn't discuss them is they're not decipherable 
and scholars are even divided over what script they're written in. The late uh, uh, Semitic epigrapher Frank Cross argued that there was a, a small piece of pottery with ink on it from Ashkelon that was written in a Cipro-Minoan script, so a west, much farther Western script. And more recently, Kyle McCarter has published uh, a small little seal with three letters on it. And he found that reading it as a Canaanite or a, 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 a sort of Semitic alphabetic inscription was extremely hard. And so he ended up sort of looking at other options like Cipro Minoan as a possible place for the script of these early Philistines. Uh, Cipro Minoan itself is not deciphered, and, and we have very few texts from this early period, so we have nothing that we can read, and we only have these hints that it's something different, that it's something foreign, that it's not the normal material in the early periods. Once we get to a thousand and later on, then we can start to read what they wrote. Mm. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a few questions about the uh, religious uh, uh, perspectives of the uh, of the Philistines. So uh, I'll take a couple of these together. Um, could you comment at all concerning the development and or adoption of the god Dagon? I mean, we know of the god Dagon from sort of much farther to the north in places like Syria as a grain god of sort of earlier periods. Um, why and how and where we would see the adoption of this by the Philistines is not clear. Uh, there have been excavations of several Philistine religious sites. One of the most interesting is the site of Nahal Patish, which is in the Negev. And there's a beautiful stand from Nahal Patish, which is in the display at the Museum of the Bible. I just sort of mentioned that. It's a beautiful uh, Philistine stand. But nevertheless, there are examples of Philistine temples like the temple at Tel Kassile, for instance, the most famous of them all. And, and there we can sort of see the development of the architecture and we can see ways in which it draws on some common parallels from around the Mediterranean, also local material. And we can get a sense for some aspects of practice, but because those things don't have inscriptions, we can't say which god or goddess they were dedicated to or precisely how those things develop through time. The best example we have of a distinctively Philistine god or goddess happens at the very end of the story of the Philistines, and it's found in an inscription from Ekron. We read about a goddess, again, who we have trouble placing for a number of reasons, called Petagaya, or pronounced different ways by different scholars. Uh, we don't know where she's from. We don't know how to connect her to other places. There have been proposals, but none of them have really uh, come to fruition, and so uh, we are left a bit adrift when it comes to aspects of Philistine religion. Okay, so this uh, might answer this next question. Uh, did the various findings indicate religious activities, uh, entities worshipped, for example, as an element of the distinction between the Philistines and the Israelites? So, so yes, they're, it, not who they're worshipping, but the way in which they're worshipping or, or even, um, even their temples themselves and the presence of those temples themselves um, are distinctively Philistine. Some of the figurines or the, the sort of pictures of the, the sort of goddess figurines and other things like that are distinctively Philistine. So uh, scholars can tell that they're dealing with Philistine religion, but you know, religion is the kind of thing that is so, there's so many possible options. There's so many things that you might believe or so many things that you might think about the world that without texts, we're really kind of scrambling. So yes, we can talk about aspects of architecture, aspects of practice, aspects of the figurines, uh, all those kinds of things are distinctively Philistine, but what they mean really escapes us. Great, thank you. Uh, let's uh, take a shift to some of the uh, relationship between the Philistine people that, that you can determine and uh, and the Israelites. And some of these are chronological, some are cultural. So I'll try to take these a little bit together. Um, uh, well, let's start with this one. Were the Israelites well established in the land of Canaan when Philistines made their presence in the region? Well established is a tricky question, um, <laughs> a tricky way to phrase it. We know that the we know that there was some group called Israel already in this land before the Philistines arrived. And the reason we know that is because of the famous Merneptah stele. Right. And Merneptah stele mentions Israel 
It's an Egyptian text, and it mentions it in the time of Merneptah, who predates Ramses III. And Ramses III, just a few decades later, is the pharaoh who first mentions the Philistines. And so we think that the Philistines arrived in the time of Ramses III, and that at that point, there, were already a there was already a group of people called Israel who was in the land. Now, what you mean by well-established, though, becomes much trickier because um, it, it, lots of things are happening in those centuries and lots of different groups of people are, are, are coming and going. And so when you think about well-established, maybe politically, that doesn't happen for some time later. Okay, great. Thank you. And then uh, a question related to the genetic uh, materials that you shared. When you showed the genetic pattern of the Philistines after the Western European hunter genetics uh, disappeared and the cultures were blending, uh, do we have a similar genetic al analysis from the Israelites? So do you have a comparison uh, between Israelite and Philistine DNA? Not yet, but we have a problem. And the problem is, is that the reason that we're able to talk about the Philistines and the way that we're able to talk about the Philistines is because they're so different. We're not looking at a very nuanced different. We're looking at a sort of aspect of their genetics that's never been seen before in the East and that relates to some group that was very different from them way back when, this Western European hunter-gatherer DNA. When we look a lot at groups that are next to each other in sort of that Levantine Klein or in that particular region, if you wanted to tell me that a group of people move from, let's just say, what is today the area of Jordan to the, what is today the area of Lebanon or something along those lines, it would be much, much, much harder from an, in the ancient world to distinguish that kind of movement because the genetic patterns are much, much closer together and had been for some time. So the, the, the reason that we can say what we can say is because of how distinctive they were. And, and you can see that we barely caught it. We, we caught that distinctiveness just in the 12th century. So even as more studies come out about the Philistines or more DNA samples are taken, you have to be really careful that you are looking at, you know exactly when they're from, not just where they're from, because you get a sample from the 10th century or from the 13th century, just on either side of that, you could miss the whole story. We would have missed the whole story if we didn't have that time sequence of early material, 12th century and material from a thousand, we never would have found it. So I think that this question of Israelite patterns is going to be much, much harder just because they're not as different as from the world around them as the Philistines are coming across the ocean. Interesting, great, thank you. Um, another question about the relationship between the Philistines and the Israelites. Um, in early biblical stories, the Philistines seem peaceful. Um, what happened later to make them aggressive? I have to uh, sort of, the follow-up is when you say early biblical stories, what do you mean? So, um, uh, and so in that sense, if you were to say early biblical stories, someone might be asking that question and be thinking about Genesis. Um, and so be thinking about the story that I mentioned where, and I couched that in some very specific language, the story that I mentioned in Genesis where you have the story of Isaac and Abimelech. Now, it's not clear at all that that story um, is originally in a Philistine context, right? And so, but Philist Philistia is the Iron Age name for that particular region. And it does appear that even in those stories which are in Genesis sort of projected back to the patriarchs in terms of the way they're set, uh, they still use the Iron Age terms for the region, right? They still use those later terms. So, so it becomes really difficult, and many scholars have talked about this, to, to think about the Philistines that those are necessarily the Philistines like the ones that I'm talking about, like these people who immigrated, or rather, whether instead it's, again, as the biblical authors themselves are framing it, is sort of using a modern term to describe an older situation, one that they're fully aware is not the same as that situation. Um, there, are exam there are more examples of this in Genesis, but that would be one way of looking at it. Again, the, the, the history of these texts and the editing of these texts and so on and so forth is a very complicated uh, um, story. And I tried to stay away from it as much as possible or make my, make my arguments not dependent on a specific view of the date of that particular text. Okay, good. Yeah, that uh, actually came up in a couple of questions, uh, the relationship between the Philistines and Genesis and then 
and then later on. So thank you for uh, for answering that complicated question. Um, good, a lot, a lot of good questions. So I'm kind of uh, scrolling through here. Um, so let's let's move kind of to the end of the the uh, Philistines. That comes up in a couple of questions here. Uh, so curious about the quote end of their story point. Uh, as a result of Nebuchadnezzar invasion, were captives relocated elsewhere? or were residents slaughtered without descendants to carry on their heritage elsewhere? Um, a lot of them were killed. We, we, I showed you the skeletons at the end that we found and I mentioned the mass graves at Ashdod. So definitely there was a lot of people who died, but uh, it was the pattern of the Babylonians to take people back to Mesopotamia. And we have people described as Ashkelonites or Ashdodites in Mesopotamia who've been taken there. And so we have the idea that many of them were taken off to Babylon to farm areas in Babylon for the Babylonians as sort of new inhabitants of new regions that were of more interest to Babylon. Um, but what we have then is those people um, are then lost to us in the sense that they no longer are a distinctive Philistine group. We don't hear about the Philistines anymore in that sense. And there's no sense at all that anyone remained in the area of Philistia. Uh, those sites seem completely abandoned. And when things pick up a little bit later on at the end of the sixth century, we have new cities that are built by people like the Phoenicians of Tyre um, who are uh, built in these same areas. And so the Philistines as an ancient people group, this group we're talking about, this biblical group, they're no more. Now, their name later on is carried on. Uh, Greek writers and Roman writers sort of pick up that old Philistine name and apply it to the land, uh, but it's not the same group of people. Okay, great. And uh, related question uh, uh, and here about um, the Babylonians did not occupy Jerusalem when they took captives. Uh, um, did, so here's the question. Did the Babylonians occupy the Philistine lands further west uh, especially uh, since they were closer to the sea. No, they left them desolate. Hmm. So we see we see no occupation between the destruction of Nebuchadnezzar in the late seventh century and then the reestablishment of the cities at the end of the sixth century. Again, under at Ashkelon, Tyrian auspices. Hmm. Great. Um, so that answers my question too. Good. Okay, this is. Uh, Interesting to track these through. So let's talk about uh, After Effects and maybe you answered this question already. Uh, do DNA companies like 23andMe have this DNA structure so we could tell, they could tell if their clients have Philistine heritage? That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, do, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I know that the material, whenever we, pu when we publish the material, uh, that it was it was made available in some known repositories. So I'm, I'm not, um, not familiar enough with precisely how those work to know who's who's going to them and how they're being pulled into various different studies. So, um, but I know that the material was made available for others to use in other studies, and it already has been. So when the when the study came out of the uh, Bronze Age material from Megiddo, for instance, they used the Ashkelon material from the Bronze Age, and they also used the Iron Age material as well. And I know that there are more studies that will come out that will use this material and help us to understand more things about it in the future, but I don't know what 23andMe is up to. Great, well, if any of you watching tonight uh, have done a 23andMe and have Philistine DNA, please put it in the comments. I think we'd all be quite interested actually. Um, and uh, more about the kind of the modern setting, uh, which museums, so thank you for this question, which museums should one visit to view Philistine artifacts, including Museum of the Bible? So I'll let you, hold, I'll let you uh, advertise for the museum there. Um, <laughs> Obviously, the, the main repository museum for sort of the history of the civilizations of Israel is the Israel Museum. Yeah. And so it has a wonderful collection of some of the finest Philistine artifacts that have been uncovered. And there is a smaller Philistine museum in Ashdod, uh, in downtown Ashdod. And so that's another place that you can go and see specifically artifacts on the Philistines uh, when you're in Israel. But many of the other museums, the Eretz Israel Museum and other places um, have uh, displays of the Philistines. And if you go to the Eretz Israel Museum in Tel Aviv, for instance, you can go see Tel Kassile, which has a temple of the Philistines right there. And so you can see the actual architecture, which is another highlight. So those are just three examples, the Ashdod Museum, the Eretz Israel Museum and the Israel Museum, 
where you can see more information if you are in Israel. Great. And uh, speaking of uh, sites today, a um, couple of related questions. Uh, what could you go, well, first, can you go to Ashkelon today? Yes, in, indeed, last year, it was the most visited national park in all of Israel, I learned. Yeah. Now, this is a, a sort of a, a mixed blessing, I suppose, because nobody was going to Masada or Caesarea, the tourist industry was destroyed. So the people who go to Ashkelon are not that group. And But you can go to Ashkelon and you can see the Canaanite gate that was found there and walk through it. And we're just in the process of finishing restoration of uh, Roman remains. So you'll be able to see sort of Roman Ashkelon as well. And so there's a lot of things that are happening there. And I think that by the time you're able to go see Ashkelon, it will be worth seeing um, in, even in the next six months as we sort of finish up some work that we've been doing in terms of restoration and get a sense for those things. But you know, the Philistine material is it, and all these sites is a little tricky because they lived in mud brick houses and um, those don't hold up very well. And so it's not as easy to see sort of Philistine architecture as you might like. Okay. And would the same be true for other sites you mentioned like uh, Goth, uh, Ekron? Yeah, Ekron is not able to be visited. It's, it's, it's farmer's fields. Um, and Ashdod is a little trickier as well. But um, if you go to the site of Telesafi Got, there's a lot of um, good signage there that gives you the story of the Philistines and gives you sort of a picture of the kinds of things that they've been doing. And they've been finding lots of spectacular material, particularly from the ninth century BC. Gaza, uh, uh, on the other hand, is sort of a, um, an unknown territory. Hmm. Okay. Good. Um, and uh, what are some of the main challenges that you find today in excavating and acquiring information about the Philistines and generally for the period that they live in? Aside from money, I'll just throw that no, out there. Excavation, <laughs> is, excavation is hard and time consuming. Yeah. And so now we, now we have published, I mentioned this publication just a second ago, uh, a, a massive volume on the early Philistines. And that joins volumes from Ashdod and Ekron and forthcoming volumes from Telesafi, uh, which are really allowing everyone to be able to research this with the results of these modern excavations at their fingertips. And so uh, a lot of those excavations, only the Telsafi excavation is sort of ongoing to some extent, um, but because of the publications that are coming out on really an annual basis, uh, the study of the Philistines is really still flourishing um, and scholars are learning more and more every year. Great, great. Um... All right, so uh, I think you kind of answered this. Are there publicly available data sets that can be downloaded, I guess, regarding the DNA? I think you kind of mentioned that. So you have yeah, the publications. So, so yeah. The publication um, of the Ashkelon DNA in Science Advances is, is open to the public. It's, not, a, it's not behind a paywall or anything else like that. So if you search for the Philistine DNA in Ashkelon, you'll, you'll come up with it pretty quickly. And then you can read in that Science Advances article where they've stored the material and all of those methods and um, repositories are uh, outlined there according to the sort of standards of the way in which ancient DNA studies are progressing. And they are progressing quite rapidly. And so there's a, there's a good community there who's working with a lot of this material. Great, okay. Um, a couple questions came up about uh, relationship to um, to a term, the sea peoples, which, well, I'll just let, let you answer that. So is there is there a relationship between the Philistines and the sea peoples? So when I showed that first slide of Medin and Habu, and I showed that inscription, yeah. I circled the Philistines because that's where we were going. But that's not the only name that's mentioned in that particular yeah. text. There are several names that are mentioned in that text. And together, all the names that are mentioned there, because they come from the islands and it appears that they sort of come across the water, those are the sea peoples. And it's a modern term that's been used to kind of encapsulate all of these groups of people who sort of appear on the Egyptian doorstep in the 12th century. And so uh, this, the Philistines are considered to be one of the sea peoples. Now, again, it's a modern name. It's not the ancient name and sort of become a modern shorthand for a way to describe the broader phenomenon at the end of the 13th and beginning of the 12th century when it seems like the Philistines may be one of several groups that are on the move. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so a pretty specific question about the, um, 
the hearths, uh, the archaeology of uh, the hearths that uh, were found in Ashkelon, and whether that has any uh, suggestion of the Hestia cult. Um, the hearths that are found in Ashkelon have parallels in the Aegean and Cyprus and all around Philistia. And most of them, um, the vast, vast majority of them, are found in simple domestic contexts. And so don't seem to have any relationship whatsoever to a particular religious observance. And so I would say that our patterns have been that these hearths are about the rewarming of food or the warming of the space and are much more a prosaic than perhaps related to any religious ceremony. If they are related to any particular religious observance, it's lost to us. Okay, great. Um, and related again to uh, religious observances, uh, you mentioned the use of figurines in religious practices. Uh, would that be an example of the five golden hemorrhoids and five golden mice offered to appease the God of the Hebrews in 1 Samuel 6? Um, the Tiva Telesophy had some theories about um, specific vessels that they thought might fit with those uh, stories here in terms of uh, somewhat cultic vessels that might be distinctively Philistines that might fit into the story. I'm, I'm not entirely convinced by their proposal, and, and we don't have anything that we can certainly say this is these are those vessels or these are those objects that are distinctively Philistine that connect to that story of the Ark and its movement through Philistia and the various Philistine cities and temples. Okay, great. Uh, and while we're on kind of biblical themes here, yeah, you know, this, these questions were coming. Um, what do we do with Goliath? Uh, you, you, talk, you touched on that a little bit with the DNA, and, or sorry, the, um, the, the stature of people. Um, and uh, similar, where does Goliath and other large statue Philistine people fit in all this? Um, what do we do with Goliath with a stone? I don't know. Um, we don't have any evidence. I've shown you the evidence that we have. I've described the evidence that we have. I don't have any other evidence that I'm holding back, nor any other evidence that I know of that pictures that shows people of large stature found in Philistine sites. In the biblical text, Goliath is by no means the normal. He's by no means a typical Philistine. And so at some level, he's bigger than the rest of them, but we don't know past that anything more about him. And he seems to be a relatively rare fellow anyway. So all I can say is that we've never found anyone taller than me. I think our tallest person is five, six. And so um, I can't really comment beyond that, except to say that there's no evidence that I have found of anyone tall. Okay. Yeah, he does seem to be an outlier, uh, which is kind of the point of the text. Um, maybe we'll wrap up uh, one or two more here. Uh, do you take volunteers on your research sites? I do, and if, if the situation, uh, if the vaccine rolls out in a, a way that is allowing us either in Israel or here to be able to do works this summer, we will do it. Um, and if it doesn't, then we'll postpone until a time that's safe. Uh, but once we do start working again, I'll be working in the Jezreel Valley uh, with Mario Martin of Tel Aviv University, and we'll be excavating material from the Canaanites and all, all the way through the Roman period, uh, really some, a, a wonderful site, the site of Tel Shimron. And so when we do, we'll welcome anyone who wants to volunteer and their time and come and join us. Uh, we'd love to do the research with them and allow them to make some of these discoveries uh, for themselves. So uh, absolutely we do. And and um, it's the kind of thing that we really love because it's a chance for us to have these kinds of conversations over a much longer period in much more detail. And we can really sort of dig into some of the, the mysteries of the ancient world. To close, I wanna thank uh, the executive director of the Friends of the uh, Israel Antiquities Authority, Emily Master for helping make arrangements for tonight. And of course, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Master for sharing your uh, 30 years of research here with us and uh, helping open up this uh, otherwise dark, uh, hard to understand period of history. So thank you for sharing with, the, uh, with us tonight. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you again. Good night.